pick up a copy of Trash War, a family card game from Quirky Engine Entertainment at Amazon.com today. I remember the skies blackening with flocking of ravens. They came to pick over the battlefield for whatever they needed to survive. We were like those ravens, prying up this to get at that, digging through filth to find whatever measly prizes we could forage to strengthen our fighting prowess. I became good with a coat rack. I managed to sharpen with a rat file. It was more gut and mud than technique. But on the battlefield, it wasn't about honor. It was about survival. Cry havoc and let slip the junkyard dogs of war. Pick up a copy of Trash War, a family card game from Quirky Engine Entertainment at Amazon.com today. The Terrifying Lies Podcast with music and stories by Craig Nibo. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the final in-between season edition of the Terrifying Lies podcast. I'm getting ready to kick in season two with a bang on the first Friday of January, 2023. Without revealing spoilers, all I can say is get ready for an epic three-part weird Western tale that I like to call Dead Packed Oblivion. Even better, I have scored the entire cinematic soundtrack for this piece. For today's interseasonal edition of the Terrifying Lies podcast, I thought I'd give you another dose of the Freestyle Gargoyles. The Freestyle Gargoyles is an experiment I and my friends like to conduct on occasion. We bring in several local authors, put them in front of a microphone, and let them perform one of their short stories. But there is more. A full band composed of ad hoc musicians, mostly made up of members of the Rust Monster Band, play an improvised soundtrack as the authors read their stories. The end result? Plenty of chaos with moments of clarity. Today, I offer two stories. The first performed by my good friend, Paul Jeunesse. The second story comes from the beautifully twisted mind of Patrick Tracy. Introducing Paul Jeunesse and the Freestyle Gargoyles.
new memoir of the hockey mask killer, Milton Pratt tells all. He's here tonight. The best job I ever had was wearing a hockey mask and scaring kids with a chainsaw. Haunted house gigs are the best, and I'll probably never have another boss who tells me to act crazier and encourages me to stop showering before work and wear the most blood-stained clothing you can find. I'm kind of a legend in the spook house community. It's a thing. Seriously, I have two Leatherface Awards because there is no one better than me at lunging at people's groins with a chainsaw. None of the little pukes could tell there was no blade on it. When they see the shape of a blade, hear that rumbling motor run, na -na 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 -na. and smell the gasoline exhaust, they know it's real. When it got near their crotch, as I chase them down dark hallways, they lose their minds, especially the guys. Teenage boys can imagine nothing worse than getting their fun factory mangled. Or a hole or a new hole created in their backside. Run! Now the girls, they would just go ballistic no matter what I did. My favorite was slicing the chainsaw toward their ankles. You might be surprised about how many of them tried to climb up onto their boyfriend's body at that moment. They would wrap their legs around him like a frightened baby orangutan. Making people scream in terror is a skill few people master. And I know that I will be remembered as a true scream artist. Seriously, look me up. My name is Milton. Pratt, but most people think of me as the character I was born to play. Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th movies and the books. Don't forget the books. I've seen all of them. I've read everything about Jason ever written, even the fan fiction. Jason versus Godzilla was my favorite. Nothing can kill Jason. Nothing. Not even a 300 foot tall. Not even Godzilla! Godzilla cannot take Jason! Ever since Hockey Mask Jason appeared in Friday the 13th Part 3 back in 1982, I dreamed of being a hero like him. He was everything a man should be. Big. Scary. Invincible, and he had a great theme song. You remember that creepy music? Kick, 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 It's my all-time favorite. It gave me hope, hope, and I needed it. I was a big, goofy kid with an ugly face and bug eyes that everyone said were about to pop out of my skull. I could barely talk because of a deformed and paralyzed tongue. All the kids teased me. They even threw rocks and hit me with sticks. I hardly beat any of them up. My specialty was breaking bedroom windows of those little punks with a baseball bat at 2 a.m. Then I would leer at them and stand still as a tombstone, wearing my very first hockey mask and carrying a machete. I couldn't really say anything scary, but I could do that, which is short for kill, kill, kill them. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Jason's mom was ruthless too. Anyway. The mask scared the crap out of those kids who picked on me. It was the real deal, bone white with little holes over the mouth and forehead. I ordered it from Canada and everything. 
I outgrew my first one. The mask that got me for my haunted house job was the best one I ever had. It came all shiny and clean. A real Detroit Red Wings goalie mask like Jason wore. I made it look just like the one in the movies. I scuffed it up. I got it dirty. I even chopped a hole in the left cheek with a meat cleaver. Getting a meat cleaver was really not easy. You'll understand why later. Now, I'm not bitter about it. And the whole no meat cleaver policy was good at my place of my place of residence. See, I worked for the Haunted Castle. It was the most popular haunted house in a five-state radius. Mostly teenagers and college students swarmed the place every year, forming huge lines that wrapped around the block. The castle was over a hundred years old. And it wasn't just a historical landmark turned into an attraction for a few days in October. It was actually the Utah State Mental Hospital, where real psychiatric patients were kept in lockdown units. I am not kidding, people. People don't believe me now, but the mental patients and the hospital staff, they ran that haunted castle for 26 years. We made over $100,000 a year to keep that hospital running until the worst day of my life back in 1988, 1998. It really happened. Google it, people. Everybody wants you to believe that the political correctness police shut the whole operation down because it was offensive to mental illness, to the mental illness community. That's just a cover story disguised in a little truth. And there's nothing else they can do for me now. I will not be silenced. The man I kept quiet for all those years passed away. And those bastards can sue me now if they want. You all need to know about Friday, October 30th, 1998, when a couple of teenagers disappeared inside the castle on Halloween night. I didn't know who they were at the time, but I found out later what perfect little rich brats they were. Jennifer Hatch. <laughs> And Brandon Young. I hate perfect little children. It's just not natural. Everyone needs a scar or a bulging eye. The haunted castle had been packed that night. Don't kill me, Milton. I'm reading good, I swear. Um, haunted castle was packed that night. There was a the last bunch of, of a co-ed group of BYU students, they were screaming and yowling in terror as they fled the building. They, they ran off through out of the, the basement, except for Jennifer and Brandon, who had crept off into a side room for some privacy. All the staff went home, the inpatients working went back to their rooms in the minimum security ward. And I stayed with Eldon to shut everything down. Eldon was my boss. And my warden, he looked like Wilford Brimley with that mustache and everything. Plus, he used to bring me elk jerky and sour candies on movie nights. He worked as an orderly in the long-term wing of the hospital. I thought, I thought of him as the father I wished I had. Since I was 21 and had my first big psychotic break, I had lived in the mental hospital. I don't want to get in all of it, but 84 was a tough year. My favorite TV show, Fantasy Island, got canceled. And I thought Jason had been killed permanently in Friday the 13th, part four, the final chapter. Major suckage. I should have known Jason getting hit in the head with a machete 17 times was not enough to take him out. I wish I would have known they would make eight more movies after that. Ten! There are ten people. Thank you, Hollywood. Thank you, Hollywood, for keeping the most important slasher film franchise of all time alive for almost 30 years. I see, 
I smile every time I think of those promiscuous camp counselors getting what they deserved, a sharp blade through the skull, a pitchfork in the chest. Such lovely memories. Oh, about teenagers getting what they deserved. Eldon and I heard the two trespassers walking on the metal stairs down the, to the second floor. As we began our final rounds, they were giggling and whispering. You hear them, Eldon said? Uh huh. I said, the, the mask muffled everything that came out of my mouth. I'll take the back stairs. You go around through the autopsy room and catch them. You scare them toward me. Uh-huh. I raised my mu rubber machete covered in fake blood. Milton, don't scare him too bad. Uh-uh. I raised my hand. Scout's horror. I couldn't say honor. I marched down the stairs, letting my size 16 steel-toed boots echo in the stairwell. I wanted them to hear me coming. I picked up a few things before I went down to the second floor where I heard them. The castle had three levels and the tour started on top and went down through a maze of scary chambers. My favorites were the torture room, the zombie room, the ghost room, the medieval torture room, the morgue, and the scariest one of them all, the psych ward. Now the trick was to make eye contact and get the whole group looking at one silent actor. You just look at them just like that and they come towards you and then all of a sudden a hidden actor comes out of nowhere, works every time, it's money. Now I caught up to Brandon and Jennifer in a hallway we called Screech Alley. I stood there under a flickering light bulb they froze. That's when I lifted the severed head. I threw the prop down the hallway. They shrieked and ran for the stairs. I stomped after them in the dark hallway, lit only by a few red light bulbs and a few pulsing strobes. That's, that's when they almost fooled me. They went behind a curtain and found an employee-only door that took them into the basement. I ended up at the exit where Eldon was waiting. What happened, Milton? Oh no! Mm. Uh, Eldon found the employee-only door and we found ourselves in a windowless basement from the original construction back in the 1890s. It was a dead end. The lights didn't work. Eldon's flashlight ran out of batteries after we caught a glimpse of them. I definitely saw blonde hair. Hey, you kids, come on out, Eldon said, then chuckled. <laughs> or I send Jason in here after you. <laughs> Milton said in the pitch blackness, just trying to be helpful. Someone squealed in terror. In hindsight, I probably should not have started up my chainsaw at that moment and revved the engine. Run! We went in after him, and the next thing I knew, a bright light flashed in my face. One of those stupid disposable Kodak cameras blinded me. I heard a thump. Eldon gasped in pain. Another flash, and I saw Elton get hit in the head. He crashed to the floor, blood pouring out of his scalp. I tried to help him, but a metal rod shattered my forearm. I dropped my chainsaw and got hit across the face with what I found out later was a piece of rebar. The hockey mask probably saved my teeth and a lot of extra pain. I remember getting hit a bunch of times on the ground then kicked, then kicked in the nuts three times. Brandon Young was an all-state baseball player who hit 46 home runs his junior year. 
The little punk had a full ride scholarship to BYU. Jennifer Hatch was a black belt in karate and taught her young women's group how to ruin a guy's day in three brutal moves. Three. They ran off while Eldon and I bled on the floor. Both of them got caught by the cops when they crashed their car on Center Street in Aura after they lost control while speeding. And they didn't get hurt, don't you worry. But poor Eldon had a bunch of broken bones and spent three weeks in the hospital. He had to take a medical retirement. We were both going to press assault charges, but the Hatch and Young family stepped in and offered hush money. They even threatened a million dollar lawsuit against the hospital. After all, Brandon and Jennifer were scared for their lives, and the fight or flight response is a powerful force. Lawyers talked. Money changed hands. Eldon needed the cash, and I took the deal. The board of trustees decided I was too big a liability to have on premises anymore. They blamed me for the whole thing, me and my stupid chainsaw. They shut the haunted castle down for good. Then they decided that I was sane. I got kicked out of the Utah State Mental Hospital. I lost my home. I lost the best job I ever had. Brandon and Jennifer got married and went to Hawaii for their honeymoon after they graduated from high school. I was waiting for them. When they got to Maui, they arrived late at night in their bungalow right off Wailea Beach. They sat on the bed kissing. And, well, I didn't wait for them to fully undress. I mean, I'm not a perv or anything. I drew aside the curtain to their outdoor patio. The metal ring scraped on the curtain rod like Freddy Krueger's fingernails on a chalkboard. They looked right at me with their perfect blue eyes as big as saucers. Their faces contorted in disbelief, then terror. Timing is everything. So I waited for the fear to sink down into their bones, for their brains to realize what they were seeing was real. And then I turned on the chainsaw I borrowed from the Polynesian gardener named Moki. Run! They both wet themselves and ran out of that bungalow, letting out what we call in the biz legit blood-curdling screams. The cops didn't show up. So after a while, I went inside and took a strawberries and champagne-scented bubble bath with tea candles all around. I ate everything in the mini bar. And that night, I watched TV in style. An old episode of Fantasy Island was on. The plane, the plane. Man, I love that show. I looked for Jennifer and Brandon, but they hopped a plane back to the mainland that night. Stalking them during their honeymoon would have been fun, but I passed the time by finding a beautiful beach to soak up the sun. No one ever hung out when I was around, except for Moki. He was bigger than me, not quite as ugly. He gave me a job, and I stayed in Hawaii permanently. I do security when famous people want to hang out on the beach. And in case you're wondering, a 300-pound guy with a hairy back, a Speedo, and a hockey mask, Pruning the rosebush bushes with a chainsaw keeps the paparazzi away. The creeps that got too close or annoy the guests on a visit, well, they get a visit from me in the middle of the night.
This has been Paul Jeunesse and the Freestyle Gargoyles. The Terrifying Lies podcast will return after this short commercial break. They say nobility comes from dying well. I say nuts to that. Nobility comes from standing like a chiseled out piece of granite against some armored mongrel coming at you with an axe handle mace wrapped in barbed wire. Nobility comes from looking that mongrel in the eye, raising your tire iron or your scorched length of cedar post and saying, come and get some. Cry havoc. Let's slip the junkyard dogs of war. Lies podcast. And now for Patrick Tracy and the Freestyle Gargoyles. To avenge, not lament. The barrel of an ancient Ticonderoga number two pencil protruded from Stretchy Guy's chest. Billy Finkel grinned, one eye not quite tracking with the other. He'd been having his headaches again, and they made him, in his mother's words, a wicked little cretin. He withdrew the pencil. Eager to learn what squishy goo lurked within Stretchy Guy's malleable body. A faint sadness that toys couldn't flinch, couldn't cry out, passed along the surface of his otherwise low wattage brain. The hole in the action buddy's flesh, Billy dared anyone to call Stretchy Guy a doll. Their asses were grass if they did, he swore glowed with a weird dark red light. He put his eye close to the hole, sniffing, dipping his finger in a bit of the leaking entrails. It was like burgundy taffy, translucent. It smelled like plastic when it heated up too much. He considered tasting it, his unkempt pinky finger hovering above the livid wound. Do not imagine that there will be no retribution for this, little Billy. You will pay a thousandfold for all the harm you have done to my person. Billy jumped back, shocked 
He looked around. The voice had been commanding and deep, like the guy who did the voice on the promos for action movies. He looked down at the chewed up pencil and the crimson stretchy guy guts on its tip. His hand went nerveless and the pencil clattered to the hardwood floor. His tongue was swollen and immobile. I, uh, with his headache really thumping along, making every heartbeat push little after images of silver against his vision, he couldn't think of anything to say. I have seen you, Billy, so filled with cruelty and hatred, broken matchbox cars littering the floor around you, smashed action figures, burned up army men. You abuse your toys, but no more. They can't strike back at you, but I have the power you can scarcely envision in your deepest dreams. Degenerate mouth breather, you shall be made to suffer for every sin. Stretchy guy? Billy asked, tentative, without knowing the index finger of his right hand burrowed into his nostril. He did, in fact, breathe through his open mouth, tongue hanging stupidly past his crooked teeth. It is I, worm, prepare for... Billy picked up the pencil again. A maniacal light brightened his imbecilic features. He struck, seized by a lunatic vigor. Stretchy guy's face popped open with the first stab, but he went on and on and on, stabbing straight through the action buddy and into his own flesh. He hardly felt the pain. Billy Finkel, massacred, stretchy guy. When the pencil snapped, he grabbed his juice glass from the table, smashing it and using the sharpest shard to cut at the toy. In the process, he sliced his hands to the bone. Soon his own blood splashed across the floor. Mi mixing with stretchy guy's annihilated remains. My God, Billy's mother said. He could hear her gasp. The pain suddenly asserted its full power. Seeing his own blood, he garped. And then he threw up, adding to the incomprehensible mess before him. Herb! 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 Get the car! His mother screamed, Alice, what in the world's going on in there? Get the car, Herb! Billy's hurt himself! Billy's vision dimmed to a deep gray and finally black. Falling, he didn't feel his head bounce against the hardwood. By the time he awoke, he lay in a hospital bed, his bandaged hands booming with pain. His parents stood outside the door talking to a doctor. He couldn't hear the words, but his mother looked mortified. He'd get a major, major whooping for this one. He'd already been in hot water with his parents for his little experiment with the WD-40 can in the front room. After this, He'd be lucky to ever get his allowance again. Billy knew that he shouldn't have let Stretchy Guy get him so riled up. It was bad for him to get angry when he was having his headaches. Should have just run you over with a lawnmower, you big jerk face, he whispered. He never got good ideas until he'd already really messed up. And he had pulled a doozy this time. Billy pretended to be asleep when they looked in on him. He was in no mood to hear what his mother had to say just yet. 
We're going to need to hang. We're going to need to send him to the psychologist this time, Herb, his mom said. She had that squealing sound to her voice that seemed to always come right before he got a spanking. His dad just grunted and blew air through his lips. Meh. The sound of the door closing finally switched, silencing the room. For a while, anyway, Billy lay awake, looking at the ceiling, the painkillers losing their strength, his headache coming back, the old acoustic tiles wavering slightly with each heartbeat. The sound of stretchy guy's voice echoed in his head. He hadn't understood some of the words, but he grasped that they meant that the action buddy was going to kick his butt real, real bad. He was all hooked up to medical equipment. He couldn't get away. Trapped and helpless, his pulse raced. That only inflamed the cuts on his hands and sent his headache into turbocharger overload. A few minutes later, a nurse came in and injected something into his IV. Blessed numbness started in his arm spreading to his face. Billy drooled all over himself. Even his throbbing hands felt far, far away, like they were hooked to the end of someone else's arms. He fell into a drugged stupor, but there was no safety there. He went to where the nightmares could get him. The action buddy waited there, now a human-sized monstrosity of oozing red plastic. Billy ran from him, stretchy guy's wrecked face and gashed open body, oozing plastic-smelling junk all the way. Billy ran, and he ran, but he could never get away. The wreck of stretchy guy's face Grown like that show he'd seen on camels in the remedial science class at school. That awful camel sound that had caused him to pee the bed that night. The worst sound in the world. made his limbs slick and chill. Both his legs went into a cramps at nearly the same instant. Exhausted, even the pain couldn't wring more than a whimper from his parched throat. He'd wet himself and he didn't even care. Billy looked around, trying to find a glass of water. There was a pitcher, but it sat well out of his reach. When he tried to sit up, his stomach muscles nodded, the pain multiplying. He made a pitiful whistling sound, casting about himself for anything to help. The air, the floor, the nightstand. Oh my God! There, on the nightstand, sat Stretchy Guy. Though Billy had cut him and stabbed him, destroying him like no toy ever, there he sat. Perfect! He even had the leather vest that Billy had lost on the first day he got him. It was Halloween night last fall, his birthday party. He'd eaten too much candy and missed two days of school, sick. Stretchy Guy had been his only friend then, the only toy he had didn't want to wreck. He'd gotten in trouble for wanting to bring the action buddy to the dinner table. I'm sorry, stretchy guy. I don't know why I did it. It's too late for remorse now, Billy. Were I human, perhaps I would feel pity. 
perhaps I would be merciful, but I am a toy, and I suffer no such scruples. I am your ruin. Billy forced his cramped, knotted body up, pulling free of his telemetry in the IV. He tumbled off the bed, hitting the ground hard. His head snapped against the hard floor tiles, splitting his skin all the way across his eyebrow. There was lots of blood. It came suddenly, getting into his eye, all over the floor, on the wall, too. Billy found he couldn't stop making that noise, even though it scared him. He just had to get away from Stretchy Guy. He just... Rising, he wheeled and staggered, reaching out to brace himself against the window. He felt it give way. The horizon began to tilt. On the floor, he saw a hunk of dislodged silicone cock, so much like Stretchy Guy's innards. Both the window and Billy rocketed into the clear air, given into the hands of gravity. Though well beyond caring at that time, perhaps Billy would have been interested to know how much he resembled all his broken toys lying there after a 12-story fall. This has been Paul Jeunesse and Patrick Tracy and the Freestyle Gargoyles. For today's song, I offer something for Christmas. I used to have this car. It was a real lemon. Every time I turned the key, something went wrong. I didn't have a ton of money back then, so I worked on the car myself, in my garage. I'm no mechanic. My DUI approach stretched repairs on forever. I must have dinged my knuckles a thousand times working on that car. Finally, I turned the whole heap of metal over to a junkyard and bought something more reliable. This Christmas song is dedicated to the most beautiful holiday of the year and to that car upon which I look back with a surprising amount of nostalgia. I now give you I'll Be Home for Christmas. I'm setting out for Christmas I'm hoping to be there I'm praying for a miracle And a little Christmas cheer I'm revving up the engine Warming up all night And if I'm really careful I should make it there all right And Christmas time is coming And I can't afford to miss Uncle Carl's endearing stories And my cousin Elwood's quill there's a cheese ball in the offing Pumpkin cookies and eggnog I'll be there with my bells on If the fuel line doesn't clog I'll be home for Christmas If I haven't blown a fuse If the rabbits keep on running Take their cues So save some figgy pudding I've got tools in the bag And underneath the floorboards Jump with cables and a jack I'll heat the radiator With a nichrome heating the brake lines in my great big canvas tent. The powertrain seems stable, but
but the tranny sometimes slips. But if I ease the accelerator, then I'll probably make the trip. The winter storm will bellow and drop its cotton low. But if my tires can be sticky, then I should. The fuel pump is pumping since I paid the guy at Joe's garage, and he told me if I'm cautious, well then I shouldn't throw a rock. I'll be home for Christmas if I haven't. Some figgy pudding. I've got tools in the back, and underneath the floorboards, jumper cables and a jack. This has been I'll Be Home for Christmas. Thanks for joining me on this between season edition of the Terrifying Lies podcast. Get ready for season two, episode one, debuting on the first Friday of January. Merry Christmas. Peace be upon you and your family. See you next year. This has been the Terrifying Lies podcast. Please come again. You're welcome here. (laughs) 